<laughs> All right, you guys, it's a little after seven, so I'm going to officially call the presentation to order. And I'm Catherine Wells, president of Denton County Master Gardener Association, and we are so delighted to partner with the Flower Mound Public Library for our annual spring gardening series. We've been doing this now, Linda, for 12 or 13 years, I think. Um, Linda Harvey is our fabulous project manager for the Flower Mound Library Spring Garden Series. She's an excellent speaker herself, and as a matter of fact, is speaking at one of the upcoming um, programs. So if you'll go to our website when you get a chance, dcmga.com, you can click on upcoming events and see all the things that are yet to come this spring, including plant sale, yay, and garden tour, yay, and the other three spring gardening series classes. February 14th will be bees and the ecosystem. February 21st will be growing microgreens. That will be Linda's presentation. And then on February 28th, gardening for the birds. So I did want to remind you that the program tonight is being recorded. Once it's done, we'll be able to share it for future viewing on our DCMGA YouTube channel. And if you have questions as the presentation unfolds, if you'd please leave them in chat and then Daniel will answer them all at the end. And uh, speaking of Daniel, our fabulous presenter tonight is uh -huh. Daniel Arenas. He is the Denton County Master Gardener Association Education Director. He was also the 2021 Denton County Master Gardener Association Educator of the Year. He is also a project manager of Beulah Acres Agroforest. He has four state Texas Master Gardener Association advanced training specialties. He's a master naturalist. He's a certified permaculture designer. And y'all, that's really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more, but I don't want to take time away from his presentation. So let me just suffice it to say, Daniel, we are so delighted to have you with us to teach us all about permaculture design tonight. Welcome. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with y'all. Uh, Zoom classes are not really my forte, but it's kind of cool because I don't have to look at everybody's face and, you know, see their reactions if I'm doing a good job or not. Uh, but it is a pleasure to be here with y'all. It's an honor to represent the Dinn County Master Gardeners Association as well. And I can already tell just by the names on the on the screen here, a lot of people I know. So don't be mad at me and we'll have a good, we're going to have a good time. I hope you enjoy. And uh, starting my presentation today, I at some point I'm going to turn off the video here so y'all can see, uh, just focus on the on the presentation on my white beard. And uh, if you are not familiar with the permaculture design concept, I'm going to tell you that it is something that has been around for many, many, many years. It is basically uh, learning and watching how nature behaves naturally, right? So the old school farmers, the indigenous people, like they have such a deep connection with the land, with nature, that they fully understand, you know, times and seasons and uh, what does work well or better for their ecoregion or for their, uh, their location. And um, there is a deep understanding behind that of, um, watching from nature and learning how everything naturally works in sync together in a way where you can uh, mimic or, or um, um, interact with it in a way where you can um, um, do your part of the job because we are part of that system as well. <clears throat> and, uh, and permaculture is also an approach um, to have to, to restore and regenerate or enhance the natural ecosystem around you in a way where you can, you know, harvest from it. Any kind of uh, human yield products uh, that comes from it, um, uh, designed and applied in a way where you are not uh, detrimenting uh, the natural behavior of things, but also enhancing it 
and also harvesting the fruits and the benefits of it. So we're, we're going to get a, a little more into it. Uh, let me see right here. I'm going to stop my video. And here's my slide. Okay, so welcome everyone again. Yes, this is this permaculture design intro is really uh, uh, it is not a full on permaculture design course. Uh, I'm going to try to do my best in about 45 minutes to an hour explaining to you how does that that concept work together. Uh, it is a really, really, really cool concept. And most of the things like if you are already a gardener, uh, you're going to hear a lot of things that would just basically uh, restart or refresh your garden brain. Uh, if you never heard about it, it's a really, really awesome approach of uh, in a way of respecting the natural ecosystem around you uh, to also benefit you and your family and your house and, and your property. So I am Daniel Reynas. I'm speaking here as a Den County Master Gardener. I also work full-time at Global Sphere Center here in Corinth, Texas, as part of the Beulah Acres Center Garden Crew. I'm the guy um, nominated to be the, the urban garden designer or the permaculture designer and educator. And it is again, a pleasure to be here with y'all. And I love when y'all have high expectations and a bunch of questions, because all of that only tells me that the subject is being very interesting. And I'm also always willing to learn from y'all. So we'll, we'll start right now. We'll go to the next slide. That should go right now. Okay, so what is permaculture? Permaculture is a, it's a forward thinking design system that was found just by watching nature uh, in, a, in a, a very complex yet simple natural system where all the plant species and wild, wildlife work together. So each of their, their jobs and their purposes are vital for the health of that ecosystem you're creating or in, interacting with. Uh, it, is, um, it is designed to create living environments. There also can be applied in, in ways where uh, you can fully explore your uh, landscape design and make it you know, look good and pretty or maybe have a more natural approach. But it's also designed to be sustainable and productive with greatly reducing the work and energy required to maintain them. So we know that uh, when you're tending and caring for your garden, like there, everything in nature, um, it, it requires a proper timing and space to happen. So as we're working and tending and loving and caring for the garden, uh, you know that, that you take the first step already predicting that it will take a certain time to mature and bear fruit and flourish, right? Uh, but one of the big goals of permaculture is to be able to participate in that process in a way that with time or along the years, you're not going to have to maybe, um, you know, work a lot harder on irrigation or have to pull that many weeds. You know, it's all really applicable to the type of landscape design you want to have in your backyard or if you have more property or if you're a farmer, but it is a... a a mindset of working with the land uh, for the greater good of the ecosystem, but also uh, generating all that productivity and surplus and abundance to yourself and your house and your family, right? So a quick history right here. Um, Bill Mollison in the 70s, Australian guy, ecologist, uh, University of Tasmania professor, he, um, he was, you know, out there, you know, he was an outdoor guy, you know, lover of the nature and the outdoors. And by observing how nature behaves naturally, he came up with several important insights. And he observed that natural systems such as forests and wetlands are sustainable. It's almost like if there were not human beings getting involved in the natural uh, functionality of the system, it will work by itself and is designed to be perpetual, is designed, you know, to last 
for a long period of time regenerating itself or um, multiplying, propagating naturally the you know plant species or you know all the the food chain and the wildlife involved in that ecosystem. It's all you know perfectly designed to naturally work amazing, right? But this guy Bill Mollison, he was the first guy to make all those insights formal. And there are actually some very, very good uh, book references you can find online about Bill Mollison. There are many references around the globe about people that have been applying permaculture principles. Um, but this guy, Bill Mollison right here, he's, he's for sure the father of, of permaculture. You know, he um, <clears throat> basically, maybe the one guy that really took the time and the passion to formalize and put everything in words and pictures and illustrations uh, so you and I can have access to it right now in a shape or a form of a, of a guideline or, a, or a, a user manual per se. This next name right here, Mr. David Holmgren, he was one of the prime times first uh, Bill Mollison's apprentices, right? This guy became so passionate about and so into the permaculture project, uh, permaculture uh, practices and concept that he has many, many, many books as well under his, um, his writing and his um, editing. So these two names, like if you wanna get into more permaculture uh, related subject, these are two really, really big names that you can go after. So let's go into the very, first steps of permaculture. There you go. Permaculture ethics and principles. So it's awesome because uh, you will you will look at this slide right here. By the way, uh, I did my best to all these slides. They have a, a link somewhere that can give you more and uh, detail and more information about it. Um, but it's uh, it's really really awesome to see that when like we hear about uh, you know recycling or um, 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 social benefits or um, uh, ecosystem uh, regeneration or food production you know all that kind of stuff when you put it all together and you try to name the horses and put them in order so again you and I can have a an amazing reference to follow. Um, Bill uh, formalized this uh, ethics and principles of permaculture. So the main three ethics of permaculture is care for the earth, care for people, fair share. One of the one of the main concepts behind all this in permaculture is that just basically saying if you plant a seed, it's because you're expecting that plant to grow and multiply and prosper. You know, to bear fruit and to uh, flourish, right? But if you're working uh, under these ethics and principles, most likely the plant is already naturally designed to give you more than you would, let's say, personally need. So you will have, like, it's designed to give you more abundance. It's designed to give you surplus, or maybe even in simple words, giving you more than you can uh, in one person consume. So the fair share part of it, it's uh, almost self-explanatory. You know, if you're taking care of nature and you're taking care of people, you have the tools and the equipment to benefit others as well. So just roughly going through the principles here, we'll, we'll stop right here. I don't know if you can see the, the little arrow right there, observe and interact on the top right of the screen, the little tree right there. So yes, we've already been talking about, you know, just when you go out there, when you go to, you know, preservation parks or heritage parks, or even just in a neighborhood park, like you just try to go out there and observe and interact. Like, you know what I mean? Like you go to a park, like you're looking, you're not just going out there to exercise or take the kids to run in the grass and, you know, or play soccer or anything like that. You're like deep inside you're going over there to interact with the natural ecosystem like we're we are all called to be outside and be part of that system like we are part of that that um complex yet simple system so going out there and observing and interacting will teach you a lot right <clears throat> so if we jump here to catch and store energy 
um, there are like just by mentioning that I'm sure your brain is going like, oh, yeah, I heard about all these possibilities. And yes, you're correct. It is as simple as utilizing the sun energy uh, in the most efficient way, but there are also ways, you know, collecting that sun energy or maybe um, there are situations where you may uh, use um, um, domesticated farm animals to do the heavy labor of the work of the land or even um, natural gas or a biodigester. So having energy, it's one thing that like for us as human beings, as we're um, um, it developing and evolving and moving forward, you know, technology advances and all that, like we're always going to need some kind of energy. So there are ways where we can obtain that energy without actually, you know, let's just say a hearty nature too much. Um, jumping to the next one here, obtain a yield. Um, it's everything, everything you're, if you're working, if you're caring for earth and people and you're looking for abundance and prosperity, like you're looking to harvest something, right? And uh, I rarely heard about a gardener that planted, I don't know, 10 onions because I really like onions and I'm gonna only plant 10 because that's all I'm gonna eat. Like you usually plant a lot more than you can, you know, eat yourself, let's just say that way. Um, so it's uh, if you're aiming to obtain some kind of yield, like you're constantly playing, like, you know, you're maybe, measuring the margin of loss you may have, you know, kind of like we had last year, a super uh, uh, winter storm going on. Like, so there are things that can happen as weather patterns and, and natural uh, uh, ecological behaviors that we, we kind of like we set ourselves a couple of steps ahead of time to make sure that we can obtain those products that we're looking for, right? <clears throat> uh, Self-regulate and uh, accept feedback, which is we're already at the, the right side here, the close to the bottom, the little planet Earth looking icon right here. Um, once you're interacting with nature, you have to be open to adjust and modify, modify right? Like you, we are, uh, as human beings, like we have a, a set of patterns and behaviors that we operate in either from our culture or for the, the place we live at or our neighborhoods or, you know, the places we go most often during the week, like we have a set of patterns and behaviors that if you keep your, your mind and your heart open to adjust and accept feedback, because, you know, sometimes we think we're, you know, we have the answer for everything and all it takes is one, you know, kind person to come and give you, give you an amazing word and, you got to be ready to accept it because that may be the one detail you're missing in the whole in the whole in the endeavor and uh, and um, experiments and uh, and and mission you are uh, going through in your garden. So going to the little horse guy right here, use and value renewables. So that's that's very key because you know we know that. Uh, by now, we, we fully understand that there are not everything is infinite in nature, right? But if you are uh, planning ahead of time into the restoration part of it, knowing that you need uh, a natural ecosystem to work uh, with you and for you as well, if you are valuing things that can be uh, renewable, it's, you know, you're never going to run out of it. You know, you, if you go back to just, um, you know, and the energy aspect, there are many, many, many really, really cool options of uh, renewable energy. That's just one aspect, just one quick example uh, that you maybe will not run out of something that is absolutely necessary for your pleasant survival, right? Okay, so if we go to the very bottom of the page here, produce no waste, in number one, it basically tells you, you know, use, as, use actually what you need. You know, if you're using more than you need, you may end up having some waste. There are strategies behind it. If you're talking about, as an example, vegetable gardening, for example, uh, and you harvest more than you, than you can uh, consume and you didn't really know exactly what to do or who to give it to or who to benefit, like all that stuff can... For example, go back to the compost. So, uh, so there are there is always a a 
a solution behind it to fix that situation. But keeping in mind that you, whatever you're doing is to not produce waste will for sure minimize, number one, the energy you're going to invest in your project or in your landscape design. And also, if you're talking about like more of a modern day, like today, um, nobody wants to, you know, spend money and time into something that is only going to give you waste. It's only more trouble for you to deal with afterwards. And okay, so if we jump here to the left, design from pattern to detail. So when you're talking about permaculture, number one is you have all that the earth aspect, but you also have the people aspect. So by watching and learning how nature operates and how uh, society uh, patterns uh, apply to the natural behavior, you know, the needs, the, the procedures, the, the, I don't know, maybe, you know, you, everybody will wish that, you know, everybody will have a, I don't know, some sort of pollinator garden in their backyards or their front yards and not everybody does, you know, so you're watching all those details to follow what nature is already doing naturally to maintain, sustain that sustainable system that it is and uh, try to apply it to your design. So integrate, it's absolutely um, putting things together, right? To me, it's really hard to design a garden for somebody and not like, oh my gosh, like think about every single detail that it's in their backyard from irrigation, from uh, where is the, the water faucet or the nozzles or what kind of nozzle I'm using or where, where, which corner of my backyard I have the most sun. So I can, so everything, uh, when you integrate all those details, it's really easy. It makes it easier to understand what you have and properly position all the elements that you want in your design. Okay, so we're going up here in the little slug picture right here on the left. Use small and slow solutions. That, <laughs> that's usually, one of the hardest aspects in permaculture, if you put it in more of a like a modern world aspect, mostly because everybody wants you know get it started, get it done, and many looks good. Let's take a family picture, in it, you know, kind of thing. But if you're if you're pacing your, yourself, you're taking your time to learn and understand and maybe study a little more or or uh, interact a little more, you know, observe. Um, how everything uh, works in your backyard, like chances are the number one is you're reducing your chances of making a mistake that can give you more work later. But it also gives you time to just enjoy what you have already, like whatever you have in your backyard, even if you don't have nothing, it's just like Bermuda grass, there is always an enjoyable aspect to it where you can uh, slowly from there build up brick by brick up until you obtain the castle of your dreams kind of thing. Jumping up again, use and value diversity. So diversity, like think about like how many plant species you have out there, how many native and perennials, how many like wildlife, like when you talk about wildlife, you're not just talking about, you know, kind of like the, you know, the big time, um, uh, animals are there or or insects like there there is this whole world of wildlife out there you know insects and and oh my gosh the pollinators the mammals the man the squirrels that sometimes like may bother you just running over you know just running across your fence and digging holes on the ground like they all have a job in there and having the diversity of species uh especially on plants like you are providing or restoring that local ecosystem you have right at the back of your house um, to value and incorporate what you're doing in your house for a bigger benefit that involves all those around you as well. You're only attracting, uh, uh, attracting all the diversity to your backyard and you're creating great resilience over time. You know, you're not, you're not supposed to, uh, under a permaculture, uh, permaculture practices, you're not supposed to design and operate into something that is only going to give you a, a headache or maybe like a second or third job throughout the week. And uh, you're not going to actually enjoy 
and harvest and, and get the best of it for you, right? Jump over again here to use edges and value the marginals. Important things happens at the intersections. Just a quick example, okay? Say you went to, I don't know if you've ever been to Clear Creek here in North Denton, but there is a beautiful prairie field right uh, merging right into a uh, wetland deep forest, right? So that margin, that edge right there, and maybe most likely because it has more sun exposure, it's where um, us as human beings or wildlife will find a, a bigger variety of food, right? Maybe like wild berries or more flowers that needs more sun. Or um, so that means you have more insect activity. And at the same time, like, you know, the wildlife from both ecosystems, they're always like, they wake up thinking about what am I going to eat today, right? So it's one of their main jobs, like, what am I going to eat today? So I'm, uh, I keep going tomorrow. They all be, meet all those edges, right? Those edges, the edges are usually um, the most active place in a natural ecosystem. So by watching it, you can get all kinds of great insights to replicate and mimic in your, in your uh, permaculture design. And then the last one up here, creatively use and respond to change. So thinking ahead of time and planning is always key, right? You're taking your time, you're watching all those patterns, you are uh, relating and interacting and integrating and not segregating. Uh, <clears throat> so all those, when you put all those principles together and you get to this very last uh, item right here, the uh, to, it's, it's basically a call to be creative. So you've been watching and living and learning through all this stuff. Now, how are you gonna apply it, right? As you're applying, you're always open to change. Like you have a big blueprint, a big plan, and you're, you know, you're working on it, you're developing and living, making mistakes and all that, but you have to keep your mind open uh, that it will change at some point. If you're watchful and willing to watch those changes and respond positively to it, it will only bring uh, benefits to your design, to your, to your permaculture design. So that's probably the item I'm going to take the longest, but it's very important because I'm sure y'all heard a lot about all this stuff right here. But under, uh, under this uh, permaculture principle here, uh, it just put together in such a simple way to understand that like, it's almost like if you follow all those 12 items around the main three in the middle, uh, it's a great guideline to keep in mind for whatever kind of design you're doing. And then we jump to the next one. It's a big energy transaction picture, right? So I just wanted to have that picture in there and kind of like, you know, you know, tell you my, my poetry behind it because look at it. Like it's a perfect balanced ecosystem. Like from all the, you know, the, the high canopy trees to the shrubs, to the ground covers, to the herbs and vegetables, to all the wildlife that can be involved in it to us as well, right there, interacting with all of that, <clears throat> to the soil, the root system of the plants, all the bacterial activity in the soil, like everything is connected. It's a, it's a full-on connected system. Like right now, as we're speaking, it doesn't matter if it's nighttime or if we're ready to finish this presentation and eat dinner and go to bed, you know what I mean? Like it's happening already. It doesn't stop they all each element in this picture here uh requires and needs the the person right next to it to work together and with it so this is just a big picture for y'all to use as a reference and there is a um uh a link at the bottom of the page as well it's a all those all those relationships in permaculture they're called energy transactions right so we jump to our next one and we get into a more uh, uh, technicality of permaculture, which is number one here is zones of use. Okay, so let's say, you know, you're, we're naming here zone zero to five, right? So zone zero, or sometimes depending on the diagram, it, it will be called a zone zero zero. Basically, it's your dwelling place. I don't know if it's your house or if it's your greenhouse as part of your design. 
but it is the place where you were living in or in the place you spend the most time throughout the week right and from there like all those zones they're measured according to time and effort that you apply to those areas or elements right so if you jump to the right side over here uh number one it doesn't have to be a circle like that <laughs> just for a uh, uh graphic purposes but say like your little house right there the little black house it's your zone zero so you jump to number one zone number one it's it is the area you're gonna visit daily it's basically you're in your kitchen you walk uh you walk outside the porch in the backyard and you're like oh i'm cooking dinner for my family and i need such and such herbs like wouldn't it be a great idea to have your herb garden right next to the back door so you don't have to walk you know all that much all the way to the back of the property or you know to the side of the house that nobody sees or you know things like that so because it's according to how much time and effort you need to apply to those areas to achieve success you try to keep them you know closer by to zone zone zero so zone one for example you can have your salad gardens and your herb gardens maybe your zone two is where you're going to have most of your vegetables maybe if you have uh chickens or maybe you know a small pond or maybe uh some fruit trees so you frequently visit that area but you don't necessarily need to go out every single day to work on it not to visit to work on it it's the time and the effort you have to apply to those uh garden uh styles or elements you have and then when you get to zone three you see like how it kind of like it uh progressively uh takes you from zone one to zone five there are more areas like zone five is where like essentially you're rarely gonna visit but since we're here on zone three say maybe you can have like a bigger orchard or maybe have your bees or maybe some animals you know if you have maybe goats or uh or a sheep or uh i don't know maybe you have a donkey or or maybe a more of a uh farmland you know you have say you have a little more property you want to plant a ton of corn you know requires a little more room you don't necessarily have to go over there every single day to work on it you know a little a little weed here and there it's fine um but you do have to check on it but you have you know more space or less time and effort that you have to apply for that area and then on zone four uh say maybe that's your foraging area say like you have you do have you know enough property to you know position all those elements in a very effect effective way say maybe you can have like a bigger pond that's where i don't know if you have cattle maybe your cattle are going to drink water from there you know those are maybe the areas where they're going to forage or or maybe it's the the deep forest tree line you know where it starts like where the you know native shrubs and uh under canopy trees are starting to you know show up and all that and then when you get to zone five which is the outer ring right here it's basically an area where you rarely manage and you most likely will go over there just to feel like you're in nature again you know you're watching and learning from it it's where you get your inspirations you know everybody has a bad hair day throughout the week or throughout the month what a better place to go out and chill out and relax than in nature right well i'm i'm that type of guy and uh if you are the same way as i am i'm sure you understand what i'm saying and we'll jump to the next slide which is our let me see there's a thing here that i can't fully oh yeah there's the link right there okay so this is that link up there will give you a uh, a quick step by step of how to start creating your permaculture garden right it doesn't matter how big your property is it doesn't matter if you live in the suburbs if you have a very small backyard there's always something you can do but the main concept behind everything is to work with nature and not against it that's the stage where you fully uh see what you understand what you have because you've been observing and learning from it but you're watching and you're researching you're learning you're mapping all those elements right you're making decisions like what do i want to have what is the best spot to have my drip line system in my veggie garden because the veggie garden 
needs to be well positioned so I can have enough sun exposure. And you know, all those little details that like, if you don't map it all till today, like today, I'm sure you're gonna wake up tomorrow and go to your garden and be like, yes, I see it, I see it better, right? So you're making decisions you have to apply, otherwise it's only on the paper, right? The paper accepts everything. But when you're applying it is when you actually know um, what are the chances of you experiencing success or not. And of course, you're always open to adjust. Uh, that's why when we're looking at the principles, you know, you take slow movements. It's because like it may change. So if you create like this whole kingdom of brick and concrete for your garden and it ends up it's not really the best spot for your veggie garden, it's basically you're either going to have to turn that area into maybe a shade garden because it's too close to the trees and pick another spot for your veggies or it's going to limit you of how much you can do, right? So the more information you get, the more understanding you will have and the more success you will achieve. So all those, all those um, uh, principles and insights, putting it all together is a thing we call landscape assessment. Every single detail in your landscape or in your property, don't matter where you live, don't matter the size of your property, all those details are extremely important and they will surely dictate what are the best predictable moves you can make in your design, right? For example, like all the property information you have, like the boundaries, the access, the position of the dwelling place, just quick examples, like, you know, how, how big your property is, what kind of fence you have or not, if it faces a green belt in the back or not, or uh, uh, if I need to work on my backyard, is my only option coming through the side gate or do I have uh, a corner lot where I can come, you know, from the other side of the fence and maybe have a bigger gate where I can, I don't know, back up a trailer or anything like that. So all those informations will help you to make your uh, your uh, uh, operation easier and more efficient, right? And also say like the position of your house, your dwelling place will tell you a whole lot of about uh, things you can uh, uh, you can do. For example, if your house is facing uh, the front door is facing south, like you know, that most likely throughout the year you're gonna have a much more uh, bigger sun exposure. So maybe you want to plan to like you know position your shrubs and and uh, under canopy trees right there in a way where in the sun uh, it projects shade to the windows, so you don't have to you know uh, hustle through that uh, electric bill or you know details like that. Climatic data. I'm just going to mention, just read through the slide here, rainfall, snowfall, temperatures, solar solstice, prevailing winds, hardness zones, growing season. So all of this is map out, mapped out in a way where, quick example, just in rainfall, uh, it is not a, this is not a, uh, 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 a rainwater management class, which we also have a module here with Villa Acres about it. But just a quick example, like you, if you know that in our area here around Corinth, around in North Texas, statistically, May is the wettest month of the year. So if you want to set up a rain barrel system, I would not start in April. <laughs> Does it make sense? Like I would rather start earlier, you know, reevaluate all my gutters and downspouts, or where is my garden gonna be? So when I have that system and I'm actually harvesting that rainfall, uh, I'm gonna properly use it. You know, so there's always a right time and a right place and um, uh, to apply all those those uh, details. You know, we're, snowfall is another good one. You know, we just had snow again, and I was just mentioning the last year with the snowstorm. Like I never ever really covered my garden, uh, my garlics and onions in my garden before. And last year we almost lost everything because it just stayed too cold for too long. And uh, I'm glad uh, our friend Janet just mentioned a couple of really, really, really cool organic natural solutions to fix that or to help you out. But say like quick example is uh, everything I covered last year, I used frost cloth, right? But it got so cold for so long that the frost cloth did nothing. So this year, we planted over, I don't know, a thousand something onions, different varieties and 1500 garlic and all that. 
So as we're planting, we're already thinking if we have to cover this thing, what would be like a, a good uh, temporary strategy to make it happen? And maybe instead of using the frost cloth, we're going to use, you know, the clear plastic, which sort of creates a microclimate as well. So, so there are all of that to say that there are uh, strategies there um, to help you out. If you're thinking ahead of time and always keeping yourself, you know, a couple steps ahead of time and also thinking not only on your next season, but always staying at least one season ahead of time, you go through spring, you prepare for summer. You're done with summer, you're excited by fall. You're working during the fall, you just wanting winter to come so you can, you know, maybe fix a bunch of stuff and or expand, you know, it all depends on your design. So all those natural elements, you know, how the, the sun moves in your property, uh, you know, because we're in the Northern hemisphere, uh, our sun is always slightly angled to the South. You know, it changes angle from uh, summer to winter kind of thing, you know, projects more shade, but say like if you're uh, uh, designing to have a solar system in your house, like it will be, way more beneficial if you have all those panels facing south other than any other direction like it's bigger chances of utilizing the sun the way it naturally moves and projects on your property right um you know what to plant you know what to grow when to harvest so calendar is always you know super super important if you especially if you're uh if you're vegetable gardening uh topography for example uh, lane contour, watershed, water tests, you know, it's um, topography basically tells you, uh, you know, elevation and how, how does the ground looks in your house. Maybe your house is in the highest spot, in the highest spot of your property. And then you know that from your house, every time it rains, the water runs down to the north side of your property, kind of like, you know, between your neighbors or to a green belt. So understanding all that, like you can explore so many possibilities of passively harvesting rain, or maybe even creating uh, rain gardens or swales, or maybe natural ponds. So understanding um, the topography of your property will also give you a ton of good possibilities that you can use efficiently, right? Uh, soil as well, you know, knowing the kind of soil you have, you know, the soil classification, horizon texture, and testing it, you know, all we hear uh, most of the times here in our area close to Corinth here, you know, it's mostly clay, you know, so there are strategies where you can work that soil quality over time, or if you need a, like a faster approach, you know, if you're replacing uh, a good chunk of that soil, maybe, let's say maybe like a 12 inches in the ground, or, uh, or maybe even a raised bed gardens, you know, that's a great way to actually justify your investment of building a garden, any kind of raised bed garden, the name itself already is self-explanatory. Like you say you have like tough clay soil that you will, it will take a little time for you to work with and, you know, get it better, but you're going to um, uh, elevate that garden and actually in a good way of saying and manipulating that, um, that soil quality for your desire, right? And uh, of course, it's always good to list everything you have as far as vegetation and wildlife. And then you start mapping everything. You know, you have a base map, sector map, zone map, bubble map, final design. The bottom line here is that the problem is the solution. So just so you know, I got to mention right here that the School of Permaculture is the school I went to to get my permaculture designer certification. It's a really, really cool website with a bunch of cool videos and information under the permaculture approach and i would if you don't mind suggest to take a look at it and we jump to the next slide here let's see try arrow down okay so very quick run through to uh our case right here in Bula acres global sphere center you see on the right side of the map right here our logo um those colorful dots right there is, you know, the red one is actually where I'm at right now. This is our Billa Acres office. The blue dot right there down to the right is where we have our watershed pond. 
to Lake Louisville. The orange dot is where we have our farm animals uh, as Villa Barnyard and the green dot right here, which is basically the center of all, all of our garden operations is our Israel prayer garden. And from there, that was the place we broke grounds uh, the first time around a little over 11 years ago. And from there, we've been restoring what we have around 25 acres of land that we've been working on you know, to design and experiment all this good stuff. And then when we get to Bill Acres Agroforest, so we're more focused on the little pretty pomegranate logo over there you saw on the map. Uh, we do have, you know, a volunteer day on Wednesdays. There is a sign up, pay, uh, sign up genius page for all of that. And, um, but our goals, one of the, the few goals we have here, you know, it's to create a food forest and utilize permaculture and uh, aim for organic produce. You know, quick note to say is that for the past over 11 years that we've been working on this property, we never used any kind of chemicals. And uh, it surely takes a little bit more effort and passion and desire to it. Uh, but it's really, really awesome to see the results right now and how much we can do. You know, we have our community garden, volunteer opportunities, uh, all the habitats for uh, wildlife and preservation of natural elements, all kinds of classes for adults and kids as well. We truly value the water conservation into the system. And uh, it is one of our biggest community outreach projects that we have. Uh, it's really, really awesome to see that our volunteers do come back, you know. Um, next slide very quick here, just explaining what we've been following for the past. Uh, Bill Acres Agrofort is a pro project that has been around for two years now, right? So it was a bare field at first, and we had a vineyard uh, all the way across that two and a half acres. And uh, it was really fun, really cool, but it was a lot of effort to not be able to make enough wine. Let's just put it that way. But, you know, jokes apart, um, it was truly a lot of work for the soil type we had. You know, the elements were not extremely uh, the best place to have a full on vineyard. And after that, we, you know, analyzing landscape and assessing our landscape, we identified that it will be a great place to explore a an agroforest system you know it's using the land or managing the land utilizing trees and shrubs and um ground covers and veggies and herbs and berries like utilizing all of that together for the benefit not only in a way of regenerating the local eco region but also uh providing all of the the things we want to harvest from it so the food forest uh concept is it is what we've been talking about like a pretty sure like I've fully described um, throughout the presentation right now, like, you know, what we're, what we're aiming for and following. But the three good examples of design strategies that we've been following is number one here on the left is the seven layers of a food forest. Basically, uh, remember that our sun here in the northern uh, hemisphere, it's slightly angled to the south. So that means that if I have my uh, my high canopy trees positioned in the south side of my property, it will most likely project a bunch of shade to the rest of the property. So I would rather position that tall tree in the northern side. And then from there, I scale down uh, <clears throat> in order to uh, uh, utilize better sun exposure, right? So fruit tree guild or any kind of tree guild, as a matter of fact, with super goes along with companion planting, which I think it's key for everything you do in your garden. Uh, it's basically say if you have an apple tree, that's your centerpiece. That's that's your main crop you're looking for, right? So I will plant around the apple tree all the beneficial plants that the apple tree needs, keeping in mind the bigger scope of the project, which is restoring and enhancing the local ecosystem, but I'm interested in those apples, right? So you can, between all the classification of, or uh, of plants, you know, kind of like the mulching plants, the nitrogen fixers, the pollinators, the pesticide plants. So you have all that variety of different plants. Remember the diversity is key. So it's very, very awesome to apply in a, in a design system like this, uh, this planting guilds right here. Really cool is that because you end up having, you know, some pretty flowers blooming in different times of the year, you can 
fully explore native species in Pirineos, and you can also have um, small wildlife habitats or maybe even uh, some vegetables and herbs planted right next to your apple tree that you end up harvesting from it. But all that system is built and put together to benefit the fruit tree, right? And then here on to the right, hugo culture mounds or sheet mulching, it's a great strategy to build better and nutritious soil over time for the future. And hugo culture mounds are basically, if you're not familiar with the concept, it's basically you have those big uh, tree trunks or logs in the middle of the mound over time, like it, it I heard saying that I heard uh, people saying that it would take at least one year or four full seasons that wood inside of the mound will become very porous and it will become a sponge. So essentially by building Hugo culture mounds, you are uh, starting to create a low watering gardening strategy also with the benefit that you can play around with some exposure on both sides, depending on how you're facing that mound. And also, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard, uh, you know, it can be contradictory, but what I hear a lot of times is that fruit trees, they love water, but not that much. So if you can keep them more uh, uh, water manageable instead of soaked with water, bigger chances of harvesting fruit, right? So Hugo culture mounds are a really, really cool strategy. And then when you put all of that together, you know, you can have a swale, a Hugo culture mound right here in the middle. I'm here on the left side on the, the, um, the sketch, the pencil sketch looking thing here. Um, so everything you're putting together, all those beneficial plants, you know, you're, you're fixing the soil, you're adding nitrogen, you're, you're looking always for high quality soil and high quality water. From there, my friends, Honestly, you need good plants. You need high quality seeds and high quality passion of you as a gardener in the gardener dedicating your time to it, right? Um, let's jump to the next one. Very quick, we'll go over a few maps. This is what we did for the agroforest before we started two years ago, right? Our base map, basically, it's a blueprint. You know, we mapped every single water line, ditches, uh, any structure we had built, you know, we dimensioned everything, measured everything, um, predicted uh, if we wanted more trellis lines here and there, if we ever needed, you know, irrigation on the other side where we don't have a water faucet, where would be the best place to run a line connected to the main water line. So as we're building, we're not trying to plant a pecan tree right on top of it, right? So that will help you not only to have a better idea of what you have or what you can do in the future, but also save you a lot of time and headache by making small mistakes. And that will give you a lot of work to fix it later. Now we jump here to the sector map. It's basically once you get your center point right there, you see the little red dot in the middle, that's where we elected to be our zone zero, right? And then from there, we started mapping all kinds of energy transactions. If it's you know where the prevailing winds come from, or if we have a bigger risk of uh, wildfire, where would it come from? Or or the noisiest part of your garden, you know, if your house is right next to the road, or anything like that, or flood areas. So sector map is basically you're mapping all the energy transactions that will happen into your property, so you can work in your design. And then we got to we get to the zone map, as you can see here on our um, um, map up here. It is not a circle like round that, right down here, you know, so we mapped it out what we have already. So we don't have to bulldoze the whole thing and start from scratch. And then from there, how can we apply the elements in a more efficient way, knowing and open to adjustments, right? And when you get to the bubble map here to the side, um, it's basically, okay, so now I have all this information put together. Now I'm going to position where do I want my compost pile? Where will be extremely beneficial to have my pollinator garden? If I want my veggie garden, where would be the best spot? So you're basically drawing bubbles around and labeling them where you have a better reference. Because once you go out there and you look at everything, it's either you have like an elephant memory and you're amazing on memorizing things, but it's always good to have a map to help you, right? Not only when you're operating and applying all those concepts and designs and strategies, 
but also like it's something you can come back like one two years later and be like man what, what was i thinking two years ago okay it makes more sense now Ooh, i'm glad we fixed that because it would be a tr lot of trouble so it helps you to document and go back to your own information because if you dedicated time and passion to it it's really good to know where did you come from and where you're going to right then we jump again here quick pictures the picture on the left is what we had in April, in early April, 2020. You remember 2020, right? So yes, that's exactly when we started our project, including the volunteer days. So we're learning and adjusting and, you know, doing our best and working together and, and, and trying to keep a smile on our faces, even though sometimes we couldn't see because we were wearing a mask. But yes, that's when we started the project. When we got to June right here, June 13 is when uh, I had another sketch, you know, more formal sketch design, you know, species of trees. There is a huge um, uh, caption list for all those elements on, on another page that I had to have. But this is kind of like, this is what we're aiming for, right? This is what we're trying to get to. And then we jump again right here on the left side. I believe it's August 15th. I can't see the date because there's, you know, my chat bar is right here on top. Oh, yes, August 15th. There you go. Uh, that's where we started digging the soil. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but you know, after mapping how all the rainwater moves, all the parking lot ammonia, where does it go to? Where does it puddle? So we're like, if we have a, a sway right there, <clears throat> overloading this pond right here, which would be the lowest spot in our property after we measured and shot all the angles and everything, uh, this system is super, super cool and beneficial for a lot more of the elements we wanted to apply in the future. So here on the picture on the right side over here, and let me see the day right here, November 2nd, you can see the swale is full. We have two dam systems to keep, keep the water inside and level to our overspill right here. And you see like this corner right here is what we call the natural food forest as we're expanding to the next areas. But essentially all this water right here, our north side is up here on the tip of this triangle, right? So all this water right here moves that way because we did a little reading and uh, evaluation of the aquifers underneath our property. And we came to the conclusion that our water moves that way, you know, after measuring the elevation of everything. So all this water there is just sitting right there that we're trying to keep it naturally. It's a, this is a natural pond, like we don't fill up with um, uh, city water or uh, we don't have a oxygenation pump or a solar pump, none of that, right? Still learning. So far, it's working well, but we're absolutely always open to suggestions and experiments. But all this water penetrates in the subsoil right here, right under our natural food forest. And in time, it may be the one area where we have the lowest need of irrigation in our design system. Let's see right here, jump to the next one. Boom. There you go. <clears throat> so in February, early this year, uh, next, last year, oh my gosh, yes. 2021, February 21st. This is what we had, right? Winter time, man, it's pretty barren. Like you see all this like lighter gray area here and some islands here and there, you know, the trellis lines are there. Um, our community garden back there and all, uh, but it's, um, it's where we've been building soil and planting things and expecting it to propagate naturally, you know, by seeds, by, by, uh, by <clears throat> um, root layering and all that kind of stuff. That will happen naturally, right? So then we get here to March in 2021. That's where we're like, okay, so where are we going from this? Let's see that sketch from 2020. Let's just do a rough sketch for 2021. Where are we going? Because, you know, February 21st, y'all remember how it was in February last year. And we're like, all right, lesson learned. Let's see how we adjust. So we came up with these new designs and expansion areas like grazing areas for our farm animals, you know, bridges, uh, chicken garden right there, an infinity chicken system, maybe a linear food forest instead of just a natural food forest. If I have all this water coming from the parking lot into my swale system, I want to have all maybe all the uh, native grasses, the big four native grasses we have in Texas, you know, it surely helps to filtrate the water and give me a better quality of water once it gets into the soil system. So we keep, you know, drawing and designing 
in August 15th right here, we're still expanding, you know, adding a few more things here and there. We started our linear food forest, our chickens. This whole strip in the back is our, the tallest layer in our system. Remember our north side is that up here on the right side at the tip of the triangle here. So we're building everything uh, according to our landscape assessment. And then when we get here to November 22nd at the end of last year, you know, we have a good foundation to keep working on it, right? Like we have a bunch of perennials. You see our pond is full, almost overcrowded over there. We did have to do some population management as far as plant species and you know, our, our grasses right here, um, the natural food forestry system, the old growth native forest going all the way across. <clears throat> over here on the right side, that's our three sisters, three sisters garden. All the trellis lines you see right here, uh, we started building a berry vertical tunnel, exploring exploring companion planting. So we're doing, you know, berries and blackberries and raspberries <clears throat> and uh, some herbs, their benefit, you know, so the whole companion plants and, and planting guild aspect behind is something I really, really enjoy. And I know that whatever we're doing now, it's only going to be beneficial for the future. And I already see that I'm three minutes over my time and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty close to finish. Just so y'all see, that's a picture of February 2nd. Beautiful snow. You know, we this time we surely took the steps ahead of time to be ready. You know, we pruned what had to be pruned. We cover what had to be covered. Um, we prepared for the snow and it surely did snow and froze a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> but like I was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation, in 2021, it lost we lost a lot of garlic and onions, a lot of it, a lot of work. And we lost way over half of everything we planted. This year, we started building you know, a few structures here and there on the more on the demonstration garden here, close to the community garden and uh, some other areas in the linear food forest, the natural areas, you know, so see like we have areas where we have a, a better structure with plastic. Some other areas that we felt more confident, you know what, the frost cloth would be sufficient. And even in some more natural areas, we're like, you know what, we're not going to cover anything because I really want to see what happens. You know, we'll either teach me a lesson for next year. If I lose everything, man, I will go ahead and, um, and design and apply something different. But we really value the fact that we can uh, not only progress positively to the future, as far as we are building this project here together, but also the fact that everything here is designed to be demonstrational and educational. It's almost like, you know, different, uh, a variety of different kinds and methods and strategies of gardening, you know, and uh, benefiting wildlife, you know, that all put together to benefit the big system as one. And of course, like here at the bottom right, you know, the two brand new signs we have from Elm Fort Chapter Master Naturalists and the Den County Master Garden Association. I love to display those. They're actually right here if you follow my cursor, right under the AgriForest logo here on the left side. This is our main bridge right, bridge right here, the main access to the AgriForest. And those signs are right at the face of everybody that drives by because you have no idea how valuable uh, it is to work with these two guys right here, these two associations. It's really, really awesome. And then we finally get to the end, you know, just a really uh, fun um, a sample of pictures of flowers and things we harvested and things we tried and uh, our, you know, partners and people that cooperate and work together. But um, needless to say that I, we fully value all the support of uh, Global Sphere Center, um, giving us the opportunity and possibility to start a dream like that <clears throat> to have our own agroforestry system here in Corinth, but also, you know, our most amazing partners coming from the top here, Illuminate, it's a, it's a creative center, uh, arts and studio for kids. That's where we have uh, all of our kids that are registered under our global gardeners, Beulah Acres, uh, Junior Master Gardener Group. So we have uh, you know, level one and level two and 11 kids in one side, seven kids on the other one, online classes. Um, and we also, you know, 100% partner with Junior Master Gardens and SWAT big time. And these people are awesome. 
And of course, right here, you see Master Naturalists and Master Gardeners. Um, today, I'm a little tempted to say that thank you so much, Den County Master Gardeners, because y'all are incredible. And I believe that this is the last slide of my presentation. I'm just going to finish by saying it is a pleasure to be here. It is awesome to be able to communicate a little bit about permaculture design. It is a subject that it will, oh my gosh, you know, give you a lifetime of research and experiences and exploring and possibilities. And we really love the fact that we can uh, not only teach, but learn from each other and even make mistakes. You know, we learned a lot of good stuff from our mistakes and we're always prepared for next year, next season. So thank you so much. It is a pleasure. And I'm gonna turn on my video again. Let me take my glasses off so I look better on the camera. Let's see. Catherine. We see you, Daniel. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Awesome Ooh, presentation. Sorry. I haven't seen any questions in the chat, just lots of wonderful compliments and thanks to you. Linda, did you pick up on any questions? I didn't see any questions, but I have one or two minor ones. Uh, how do you get your aerial shots? Do you have your own drone? We do. We do have our own drone, but we also have because uh, the Global Sphere Center is also our church, and there are a lot of cool dudes over here. You know, they they will offer to come and help and volunteer as well. Okay, I think those are very helpful. And then th this is a kind of a one-off. You said your uh, the logo there that was a pomegranate. Why did you pick a pomegranate? Uh -huh. <laughs> that's the first time I asked I answer uh, asked that question. Uh, the pomegranate is a symbol of. Uh, working together in creativity because it bears many seeds out of one fruit. I thought it was a poppy and that would be the <laughs> same thing. I did. I thought it was a poppy. Hey, hey I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, creative minds, they mm -hmm. see all kinds of cool stuff, you know, and it could be a poppy. It looks Poppies like a poppy. Poppies have lots of seeds too. Yeah, a yes, poppy yes, seed pod yes. with many, many seeds that grow to very big, much bigger plants with their tiny little seeds. I thought it was a poppy. <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> Sherry, did you have a question? Um, I did. I, you know, Daniel, I was just curious is to um, to know that. Um, what you put over your onions, was it more, was it kind of like a cold frame that you built? Um, and is it removable? Or? It is removable, yes. Um, I would say that 95% of the structures we build here to cover plants for winter, there are something that we can take apart if we ever need to. Uh, that The picture you saw over there in the presentation, we just Honestly, only use two by fours, like treated lumber, two by fours. And we got that uh, painter's uh, translucent white plastic from Home Depot. I believe it's either a three mil or six mil. Um, they're resistant enough where you can cover it as a tarp and maybe use staples if you have to. Um, if you leave them out in the summer to solarize your garden, like you may have a little trouble with the plastic ripping off because of the heat. But for the winter time, it works great. Like as soon as we open our gardens with onions and garlic, you can 100% tell that the plastic was very sweaty on the inside and a lot warmer than the outside too. I'm curious as to see uh, how it protects your onions. <laughs> Well, they're, they're looking good. Today we were actually, because of the, the good weather for this week and the next one, we were just uncovering everything, you know, give him a little drink of water, let him, you know, get a little suntan and all. And mm -hmm. it was actually, you know, very surprising to see that there was like one or two onions and garlic that like it wasn't really looking that pretty, you know, some, some burned yellow greens. But I do know I can come back and, you know, kind of like give them a, a shorter haircut. It's too early in the season for them, you know, as long as they have strong root systems and they still have some green is taken out, uh, we, we're confident that we can work on it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Daniel, Janet has an interesting and good question, too. Do you have plans to add a medicinal plant area in additional in addition to your edible vegetables and herbs? 
Yes, medicinal plants. I'm looking at the, oh yeah, right here. Janet, you're always full of good questions. Listen, we already have a couple of pockets only designated for cooking herbs and medicinal plants. We also have, uh, the reason for that is, you know, we're building something uh, for the future as well, but um, we have our first fruits farmer's market here in our property once a month and everything we harvest from the fields, whatever, anything we can process and preserve as far as uh, let's say kitchen stuff, uh, we work on all of that, but we also have a, a division that it's uh, more to like the botanical side. So we do make home medicines and teas and all that kind of stuff. And yes, we do have uh, a ton of medicinal plants and we're 100% increasing that population of medicinal beneficial plants.